10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust and it has cleared the tower. Clear the tower. This is Mission Control Houston. We appear to have a good first stage at this no point. complete roll program. Houston, roger roll. Thirteen, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Okay. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, Houston, we've had a problem. When I was a young kid, I, I learned a little bit about what the Germans were doing in V2s, because this is during World War II, and I got really interested in rocketry. Eventually, then, at my senior year in high school, I got hold of a pamphlet by Robert Goddard. He was a, a scientist in Worcester, Massachusetts, and had written a pamphlet, uh, this is 1913, on using liquid rocket engines to obtain high altitudes. And I didn't understand a lot of what he was saying, but it got me very much interested. And so my senior year in high school, we, uh, well, a friend of mine and I, we built a little solid rocket, uh, you know, just to keep the enthusiasm going. And I went into University of Wisconsin, uh, mechanical engineering. I can't tell you today why I did that, but I kind of th thought that that would finally need me if I could get a degree in mechanical engineering, I could get into whatever I wanted to do. I, and probably just about everybody else, didn't really think about space flight except in a uh, more or less in a fantasy type thing. I've read a lot about uh, you know, all the, the comics about space people and things like that. And of course, I was interested in rockets and going up there, but, but it was all imagination at this particular time until NASA uh, you know, put out the requirement for for doing the the Mercury program. The first time they asked for astronauts, uh, I was a, you know, I had had a graduate of a test pilot school, and so I was asked if I wanted to join the group, and I said, well, certainly, yes. This is this is what I've always wanted to do, and I went to take my physical with the original 32 that were thing, and I was the only guy to flunk. And <laughs> I was disappointed. And then about two years later, I know NASA needed some more astronauts, and so they finally came out and asked for more volunteers, and the Navy called me again and said, uh, are you interested in getting back in the program or getting into the program? And they didn't know that I had flunked the physical the first time, and I said, certainly. And I, then I applied again, and uh, then I made it through the Gemini program. Uh, when I came back from Apollo 8, I was assigned to Neil Armstrong's backup, the backup commander of Apollo 11. And uh, during that time, uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin was the co-pilot to Neil for the Apollo 11 flight. And there was a lot of animosity because uh, sort of Buzz thought that he should be the first one to walk down the ladder and step on the moon. One time, uh, NASA management talked to Neil and said, look, if you want to, uh, we'll replace uh, Buzz with, uh, with Lovell. And, uh, and, and Neil said, no, no, I'll stick with Buzz only because I know that Jim wants to be a, uh, be a commander of one of these flights. And if I, he goes as a, as a secondary guy, then he probably, because he'd be on the moon too, that he'd be asked to do other things and never get another flight. And so he, it, was, it was Neil that you know, said, I'll stick with Buzz. Apollo 13 was the most unusual flight. Uh, being on a flight that had an accident 200,000 miles from, and getting back safely, working closely with mission control, but doing all the execution of the stuff that we had to do, 
it, it really is a, more of an indication of the ability of what someone can do than just being the second guy on the moon. Well, Apollo 13 was going to be the third lunar mission. Uh, we were going to go to a place called Fra Mauro. This is going to be a, a sort of a mountainous type or more of a hilly type of facility than the previous uh, two flights. And because they thought that the material there was different than the material that had been brought back on 11 and 12. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, I uh, have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay, stand by. First of all, when they were building the liquid oxygen tanks, the company building the liquid oxygen tanks, dropped a tank on the factory floor. The tank was uh, originally going into uh, Apollo 10, I think. Uh, but because it was delayed, uh, that was rescheduled for Apollo 13. They picked it up uh, and they rechecked it to make sure that it could do its job, deliver oxygen to the spacecraft for breathing and for real, uh, making electrical power. Everything worked fine. But the tank had a second objective, uh, or second function, I should say. There was some a tubing inside that tank so arranged that uh, after a test they could remove the liquid oxygen by just blowing gaseous oxygen in the fill line and it would be forced out the vent line. That too was damaged at the drop of the tank. They did not check whether that would function or not. Now, let me go back to 1965. At the launch site, there was 65 volt power available for operations. Even though the spacecraft flew at a 28 volt power system, uh, they thought that if something just happened to the spacecraft on the launch site, why don't we make it capable to use that power? So the manufacturer of the spacecraft told the manufacturer of the liquid oxygen tanks remove the thermostats and replace them with ones that are capable of handling 65 volt power. The thermostats were never replaced. And the spacecraft manufacturer never double checked to see that that directive was complied with. Okay, now back on the launch site, two weeks before the launch, they try to remove the liquid oxygen, impossible. So they said, well, wait a second. We have power out of the launch site. That's 65 volt power. Uh, they're protected. Why don't we just apply that power? And, and inside the liquid oxygen tank, there was a little heater. And the heater was used during the flight to convert some of the liquid into gaseous oxygen to function into the spacecraft. Let's turn that heater on and just boil the oxygen out at that time because everything else was fine. That's what they did. Turn the heater on. And sure enough, as they were predicted, the liquid oxygen started going to gases, but the temperature in the tank rose. When it got up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the little thermostats capable of only 28 started to open up to protect the thing, but the 65 volt power welded them shut. And from then on, there was no protection. We know now that the temperature inside that tank got up to a three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Took, took all the liquid oxygen out, no, no bomb, no, no fire, but melted all the wire, the protective wiring uh, on there and exposed all the wiring to a potential uh, spark of some sort. But it was not detected, nothing happened. Oxygen was removed. The day before the launch, the tank was filled up with liquid oxygen. From that time, the tank was a bomb waiting to go off. 200,000 miles from space on April 13th. Swicker threw a switch to turn on the heater a little bit to get oxygen, and the tank blew. Okay, you're, 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 you're,
What's the matter with the data you got? Computer current looks normal. Okay. We got more of a problem. Okay, listen, listen, you guys. We've lost uh, fuel cell one and two pressure. We lost uh, O2 tank two pressure. Uh, you want to look at it? And temperature. Oh, Houston, we've had a problem. Okay. Stand by, they got a problem. I heard just a, a big sharp bang, and the spacecraft rocked back and forth. And then I looked up at Fred Hayes to see if he knew what caused the problem. And uh, then I, uh, as I got into the command module, I looked at Jack Swiker, and his eyes were as white as saucers. He didn't know what the problem was. But the first indications that something was wrong was the fact that I noticed that one of our fuel cells was inoperative. Uh, and then as I started to glance around at various things, I saw that uh, in our indicators of the liquid oxygen, one tank was empty and one tank had the fuel uh, oxygen uh, going down. And so I knew that something was desperately wrong. I can't tell you why today, why I looked out the window, but when I looked out the side window, I saw escaping at a high rate of speed, sort of a fan uh, uh, system, that uh, uh, of gaseous substance. And I look today, looking out the uh, hatch, that we are venting something. So we are uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. It's a gas of some sort. And it didn't take much intelligence on my part to understand that the corner gauges that I'm looking at and the, uh, and the gas that I was saying that we are losing all of our liquid oxygen and qu very quickly we would be out of liquid oxygen uh, and essentially the whole command module would die. This was a flight that was snake bit from the, from the very beginning. And so when the explosion occurred, you know, that was the epitome of the problems. Here in mission control, we're looking, uh, now looking towards an alternate mission, swinging around the moon and using the uh, lunar module power systems because of the situation that has developed here this evening. This is Apollo Control Houston. When that explosion occurred, my dream evaporated. I knew that there'd be no landing on a, of 13 on the moon, regardless of what the situation, even before I knew what was happening. I knew that there was, there was and uh, it was only after I came back and landed uh, safely that I was disappointed that the situation occurred that I never could land on the moon. Can we review our status here, Cy, and see what we've got from a standpoint of status? What do you think we got in the spacecraft that's good? The explosion occurred at just the only place that it could have happened that would re result in a successful recovery. If it happened any time after we got in lunar orbit or when we were on the surface, uh, we'd never have the fuel to get either back up to rendezvous with the command module or even to get uncaptured by the moon. Okay, does it look like it's still going down? It's uh, slowly going to zero and uh, we're uh, starting to think about uh, lamb lifeboat. Yeah, that's what we're thinking about too. Well, we all came to the conclusion that the only way we were going to get home was to use the lunar module as a lifeboat and what it has and does it have enough oxygen and things like that. Well, the lunar module was not a device you want to spend a lot of time in. Uh, it's, it was designed for two people for two days. And of course, we had Swiker that came, came in too, so there's three people and we're there as we've determined now for at least four days to get home. Uh, and so it was, it was kind of cramped. And of course, the first thing we had to do was uh, power down everything. So uh, to save electrical power. The, but the main thing that we had to worry about, we found out, was uh, the carbon dioxide in the lunar module. It took a bit of innovation and uh, in thinking uh, to make that difference. And uh, we did it. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that the crew got the information and we could actually make it so that we wouldn't uh, pass out uh, by starting to breathe carbon dioxide. As we got towards the Earth and we're getting ready to take care of everything, we managed to get electrical power back into the command module's uh, battery 
So have enough power there to have the command module alone to the, for the descent. As it floated away, we could take pictures of the whole side of the uh, service module being blown out. And that's when we worried about, well, that was kind of close to the heat shield. Uh, did it damage the heat shield at all? But there was nothing we could do about it anyway. Uh, if the heat shield was damaged, it was damaged, and so that was it. Well, then after we got rid of the service module, we eventually got rid of the lunar module, and we were by ourselves in this command module again, and hopefully that with the power now, we had the computer running again, and it knew where we were, and it knew where we were supposed to land. At least that's what we hoped it did with all this rearrangements. And so we got into the back end and we started our descent. But it wasn't, it wasn't until we were safely on the water and I could see droplets in the window and knew that we had come back uh, to the earth that uh, if, in, unless the, the, the task force was someplace else, I think we were in pretty good shape. Well, I think that our, our odds at the time of the explosion occurred. Well, we lost, and we knew we lost the command module, that, that whole system, that we're, they're pretty low. They're, but the thing is, when you're in a situation like this, you don't think of the odds. You think of only how to improve the odds. It was a beautiful case of good leadership, uh, good teamwork, and the good use of initiative. Uh, by the you know ground control people who are, did a great job working closely with the crew who was you know, executing all those things uh, correctly. So that's what got us home. I never left Maryland a farewell a letter. In Apollo 8, I never did either. Now, my two companions, Warman and Anders, wrote farewell letters. Instead, I had Nima Marcus deliver a Christmas package on Christmas Eve <laughs> as my farewell letter. And on 13, of course, I never really thought about that. By this time, I thought things were really routine. I mean, you know, uh, there's the chances of a big accident are less and less. We've had a couple of successful flights. Now, at the press conference, after 13, behind me was a lot of NASA's hierarchy. And a newspaper guy got up at this big thing and said, Jim, are you going to ask to have another flight? And in that brief moment, that thousandth of a second, I said, oh my God, what a chance to get these guys and, and nail it. On. And so I was about ready to say, well, naturally, because, you know, they will guarantee. And then I looked out in the back of the audience, and there was a hand that went up. And I said, <laughs> and it was my wife. <laughs> and so I said, well, I think we ought to let some other people try it. <laughs> I thought 11 was the natural thing to have a, make a movie out of. 13 was a little bit different. Uh, and I have to uh, think quite often. And talking to my cohorts, say, in Mission Control, uh, and movie, I've done a lot of uh, talks with, uh, with uh, Gene Krantz. And I would like to say it. I haven't told him yet, but the next time I see him, I'm going to say it now. Gene, what would have happened if Apollo 13 was successful? You know, there wasn't an explosion. A movie would not have been made. You wouldn't have become famous when Ed Harris said, failure is not an option. <laughs> I thought that we should go back to the moon and learn about going to the moon uh, with the proper architecture and make it a routine thing so we could use that to go to Mars. And eventually, because someone's going to go to Mars. Only because Mars is there. 
Well, when I first came down, of course, I thought 13 was a failure. And also, uh, NASA thought it was a failure. They didn't really understand the significance of what happened. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, they tried to emphasize uh, Apollo 12 and, and Apollo 11. Apollo 13's command module, after it was inspected, ended up in a, uh, uh, in a warehouse. My thoughts are that the accident of Apollo 13 was the best thing that could happen to NASA. People were getting very complacent. And, and, and so when 13 occurred, at the time that it occurred, because it could have been a complete disaster, which would have probably ruined the whole space program, uh, it was the best thing that could have happened. Because it brought out the ingenuity, the leadership, and the teamwork that that the NASA Control Center had, along with the crew that could uh, do, uh, actually comply with and execute the things. To, we got back a, a spacecraft of almost certain catastrophe to a successful recovery. So I'm very proud of 13. Even though I didn't land on the moon, that was a disappointment for me. But then, you know, a lot of people landed on the moon, so, <laughs> so why should I? And, and, if, and if 13 was a very successful flight, I wouldn't be sitting here today to talk about it.